Hello, good evening all. Nashik Bar Association, Ayoji. Atso he ekonchali sabo webinar ya thikani sampanna hota hai. Lockdown cha ya kada vakilanna kaza pure pure fayda baba manu Nashik Bar Association cha adhyaksha Nitin Thakre. Ani sarva पदाधिकारी यांनी या लॉकडाऊनचा चांगला उपयोग करण्याचं ठरवून वेबिनार घ्यायचं ठरवलं आणि आज जवळजवळ अडोतीस वेबिनार आपण या ठिकाणी घेतलेले आहेत आजचं हे एकोणचाळीसावं वेबिनार या ठिकाणी संपन्न होत आहे आजच्या या वेबिनारच्या वक्त्या आहेत ऍडव्होकेट प्रज्ञा तळेकर हायकोर्ट बॉम्बे आणि त्यांचा विषय आहे टूल्स ऑफ इंटरप्रिटेशन ऑफ अँड इट्स युटिलिटी इन डिस्ट्रिक्ट कोर्ट प्रॅक्टिस त्यांचा थोडक्यात परिचय मी आपणास या ठिकाणी करून देतो ऍडव्होकेट प्रज्ञान तळेकर इज अ डॉटर ऑफ ऍडव्होकेट सतीश तळेकर सी इज अ ग्रॅज्युएट ऑफ लॉ फ्रॉम नॅशनल लॉ युनिव्हर्सिटी जोधपूर विथ अ ऑनर डिग्री इन इंटेलेक्च्युअल प्रॉपर्टी राईट्स ऍज वेल ऍज अ डिस्टिंक्शन होल्डर इन अ पोस्ट ग्रॅज्युएशन कोर्स फ्रॉम युनिव्हर्सिटी ऑफ ऑक्सफर्ड युके इन लेस then 6 years at the bar pradna talekar has conducted a diverse variety of matters concern concerning constitutional law civil and property rights taxation commercial corporate as well as criminal law she has nearly 50 reported judgments in her credit and is known for her stellar performance in court I was fortunate to have a very inspiring mentor who who has always encouraged her and all his other juniors take on any case and argue with conviction without fearing for the strength of the opposite counsel or the inclination of the bench only relying on relentless research and creative arguments with such training she has a young at a young age has successfully appeared in high stake matters argued complex constitutional issues and also prepared against some of the finest lawyers in the country including mukul rohtagi apil sibal shekhar nafde jayesh bhushan shri haryane ram apte mihir desai and several others Pradnath Dalekar understands the important role that mentorship has played in her life and thus spent some time mentoring associates and in interns in skill required at litigation and what law students and young lawyers can do differently to build a credible name at the bar she has been instrumental in organizing the first national advocacy workshop in the country to encourage law students to join the bar and help them own their advocacy skills which is now undertaken annually in par in partnership with eastern book company and scc online am has also chairs the confederation of indian industries indian women network chapter at aurangabad which works to provide a peer network and support group for professional women now i would like to invite our today's lecture to deliver her specious lecture pradna telekar ma'am thank you so much it was a very kind introduction i'm not only uh, pleased it's an honor to address all you esteemed lawyers 
at the Nasik District Bar. And I must commend before we begin with the talk that what you're doing, this series of lectures is amazing. And it's one of the only bars which has carved out a name for itself in this lockdown by inviting many speakers and having a very uh, curious audience with uh, loads of questions and I'm sure it's going to be of value to everybody else also, not only your bar, but members outside the bar as well. So thank you. Uh, let's begin the topic. Uh, what we have for today is tools of interpretation. Uh, why this came to my mind was, sir, what language should I use? Only English or a mix of English and Marathi? Only English will do, but if, okay. uh, it's your choice, ma'am. You can use Marathi as well. Thank you. So why I came up with this topic was uh, because generally as law students, when we are aspiring to join one of the tiers of courts, what we think is if we are joining the constitutional courts, either at the high court or the Supreme Court or uh, the other courts in the hierarchy, uh, one of the prime concerns that people tell us, senior advocates, is that um, in the lower courts, you will be dealing more with facts and you will learn the art of uh, cross-examination and uh, how to interpret and marshal the facts well. And if you go to the constitutional courts, you will be dealing more with the law. What I have realized in my six years at the bar is that a lawyer would be a fine lawyer either at the district court or the high court or the Supreme Court or any other fora only if he can marshal the facts well as well as apply the law to the facts correctly. An application of law is not a mechanical process. It is equally a process of interpretation. And interpretation is not a function which will uh, be uh, used only by the High Court and the Supreme Court, but it can equally be used by the district courts and all the other uh, judicial and quasi-judicial authorities, whichever is involved in application of the law. The difference would only be to the extent of its precedential value that is its binding effect on all the other cases to follow, which would be um, so far as the Supreme Court and Article 141 is concerned or the High Court being a court of record. It may not be as much for the other courts, but that does not mean that rules of interpretation would not apply or skills of interpretation should not be honed in the lower judiciary. What we see more often than not, and I'm sure uh, all my senior colleagues here would agree, that uh, most often in the subordinate judiciary or uh, quasi-judicial authorities, we see that a high court judgment is picked up and verbatim attempted to be applied. Not much time is spent in interpreting or understanding what is the ratio of that case, whether it really applies to these facts of the case. And if it does not apply and there's a vacuum in law or vacuum in terms of which precedent is to apply, then whether laws are interpreted at the subordinate court levels. So how can we make this a regular affair? Once the bar is strengthened to believe that these are rules which can be applied even at the subordinate courts and they become equipped to use these tools, I'm sure that the courts will weigh in on interpretation as well. Uh, so I have prepared a short uh, presentation which I would like to share uh, so that we can cover as many aspects as possible. Just give me a minute. Is this visible to everybody? Because I'm not on Zoom anymore, so I can't see the reaction. Yes, yes. Yeah, thank you. So what I wish to cover in this talk is three things. One is what ratio residenda is. What are the three tests that are used to identify the ratio of any judgment? Second is the rules of interpretation. How did we move from the original literal rule to several other rules, which are all in the basket of um, tools of a lawyer today and different rules are used in different uh, circumstances. And lastly, the doctrines that have been evolved to counter uh, several situations. So first we begin with ratio. Uh, what ratio decidendi literally means is uh, the rationale of any decision. The process of determining the ratio is the analysis of 
which is conclusive as against the persons who are not parties to the case meaning that any judgment would not apply in its totality uh, as a precedent the principle of stare decisis says that all the judgments uh, that are delivered by the high court and the supreme court would be binding on all the other courts as well as that very court if uh, the bench size is the same or lower but when they say it would be binding they do not mean that the entire judgment would be binding what they mean is only the ratio of that judgment the principle that can be culled out from the judgment would be binding on uh, subsequent cases to follow but this is a very confusing part and um, we are generally not taught how to locate or how to identify the ratio so how is uh, ratio decidendi different from res judicata and does it have any similarity with uh, when judgments apply in rem so res judicata is a principle embodied in uh, section 11 of the cpc which basically means that so far as the parties of the suit or the case in question they would be bound by that decision in rem would only mean that the operative part of that judgment would bind even third parties who were not parties to the suit or the case this is very different from the ratio which will bind everybody else in principle not in the operating part of that order or the judgment now ratio is exactly the opposite or the corollary of ratio would be obiter dicta which literally translates into observations of the court any observations which are made which are not forming part of the binding principle of a judgment is called the obiter dicta and the obiter dicta as was rightly said by honorable justice krishna iyer in uh, the matter of mohinder singh gill that obiter dicta does not even bind the author much less any other court since then the law has seen a certain march and we now believe that the subordinate courts are bound even by the obiter dicta that falls from the supreme court but this can be distinguished in some cases where the ratio of another case has a stronger bearing now what is the importance of ratio decidendi it's extremely important because whenever we want to say that a certain case is uh, squarely covering the facts of your matter or is clearly applicable in your favor you can rely on this judgment what you have to see is there may be thousand facts in that judgment and not each of the fact can be replicated in your case so whether the ratio of that case is in your favor if you can prove that much you would have been successfully able to rely on that judgment so the most significant part of ratio is its reliance and its precedential value for subsequent cases now there are three tests uh, to identify uh, a ratio of a case the first is the uh, uh, test developed by lord halsbury the second is by professor vamgo and the last one is by mr goodhart now the first test of uh, uh, lord halsbury came in this judgment called quinn versus lethem and what he says is that a case is not this is quoted exactly from the judgment a case is only an authority for what it actually decides i entirely deny that it can be quoted for a proposition that may seem to follow logically from it which means that because there are several facts which make the case in which the decision uh, is delivered in a certain way you cannot decide a corollary of that decision or something that you feel is a logical consequence of that uh, decision and say this is what the ratio of the decision is it is only what it has decided so this is a very narrow view to look at the ratio decidendi and the test that he gave was to identify what are the peculiarities of the particular case which was decided not the generality of the reason or the general words which are used in the decision only the peculiarities of the particular case which would mean what are the peculiar facts or what are the peculiar reasons not the general reasons in a particular case now an example of this is the gujarat high court full bench decision in 
wherein a question came this was a full bench uh, which was constituted because two division benches had uh, contradictory judgments on what is the definition of uh, or the scope of dangerous person within the meaning of section 2c of gujarat prevention of anti social activities act and um, what they really wanted to know was whenever there are offenses which are pending investigation under the arms act whether such persons who uh, have offenses pending investigation would fall within the meaning of dangerous person or not now uh, one of the division benches had heavily relied on a supreme court judgment which came in 1990 which was also discussing the prevention of anti social activities act 1985 and which happened to say amongst many other things that uh, i've quoted it in the last paragraph merely on consideration of other three criminal cases which are under investigation and yet to be decided the detaining authority cannot come to a subjective satisfaction that the detainee was a serious was a dangerous person who habitually indulges in committing offenses referred to in section 2c of the psa act and this was the judgment of abdul rasak in the supreme court in 1990 so what uh, lay before the uh, full bench of the gujarat high court was whether this observation amounts to ratio such that it is binding on the full bench of the gujarat high court or is it only a vitor and it is not binding and therefore a different uh, stand can be taken by the high court and out of the three judges of the high court Uh, the majority decision said that this is not binding based on the halsbury's test which said that you will have to look at the peculiarity of that case and see whether those peculiarities exist in this particular case whereas the dissenting judge honorable justice dave he said that apply any test may it be halsbury or the inversion test by vamgo all the tests would lead to say that this was indeed the ratio of supreme court now we can see when the judges of high court can differ on what is a ratio of a particular judgment how complicated it generally is and when i say it is complicated what it also means is that is the amount of scope that any judgment has for interpretation in terms of its ratio to see whether it can be made applicable or distinguished now the second um, test is that which was given by professor vamgo and it is uh, called as the inversion test this is the more widely used test and the concept is that the ratio decidendi is the general rule without which the case would have been decided otherwise so this is the primary rule and if i put the word not in this rule then the case outcome would be entirely different say to take an example if a is convicted because of a confession and then my proposition would be that a was convicted because he confessed then if i put a not in this that he did not confess then would my conclusion be different of course because he was convicted because of the confession so if there is no confession there would be no conviction and therefore they say you identify a proposition of law which you believe if to be the ratio you inverse it in the word not or any negative outcome of the judgment would change or would it not change if it changes then it means that this is the ratio if it does not alter then this is not the ratio now a criticism of this uh, test for ratio decidendi is that this assumes that there will be a single uh, ratio and there will be a single principle based on which the case will turn from yes to no this is often not the case in a complicated set of nuanced facts another uh, problem with this is that uh, it easily helps us to identify all the uh, principles which are not the ratio but to identify the set of uh, facts which would make the ratio it is not always accurate because there can be more than one principle which becomes the ratio now a recent example for this is the supreme court judgment in the case of state of gujarat versus utility users welfare association 
And here, the question before the Honorable Supreme Court was, when you are interpreting Section 84 or 86 of the Electricity Act, is it necessary that the chairperson has to be from a legal background? Or is it necessary that any of the members, but minimum of one members, should be from the legal background? And the court was interpreting uh, or looking at what the ratio of an earlier judgment in 2014 of the Supreme Court would be. And that judgment was in the case of Tamil Nadu, uh, some association, which also dealt with Section 86 of the Electricity Act. And that said that uh, all the members, including the chairperson, have common set of eligibility criteria when they are to be appointed. And one of the facts they mentioned was that the chairperson uh, or any member of the chairperson should have the knowledge of law and it is essential for the commission to function well that the members have knowledge of law. But when the court put these two propositions, two propositions they came out with, one was whether the chair, the first proposition was that the chairperson is not from legal fraternity. And the second proposition was, none of the members are from legal fraternity. And what they saw was when they used the first proposition, nothing changed in the conclusion of the 2014 judgment. So even if the chairman is not from legal fraternity, the judgment would have been delivered in the same manner that it was in 2014. But when they said none of the members is from uh, has a legal background or knowledge of law, then certainly the judgment in 2014 case would have altered. Therefore, they realized that the ratio was really that one of the members has to have a background in law, but not necessarily the chairperson of the commission. Uh, the final test is that of Goodhart, and this is the most widely uh, used test today. The concept here was that it is by the choice of material facts that the judge creates the law. Reasons only help us to identify these material facts and the principles accepted and applied in the decision. So the test is to find out which was that material fact that led to a particular decision. And both these combined would form the ratio of a judgment. Uh, a typical example that was used by uh, Goodhart in his own article was that of Hambrook versus Stokes. This is an English judgment. And the facts are somewhat that a woman died of a shock when she witnessed a car accident caused by the defendant's carelessness, which threatened to kill or injure her child who was standing at a distance. And uh, the woman's husband, after her death, claimed for damages, and he was successful in the court. Now, the court looked at the distinction between um, the wife being a direct witness of the incident as against she having heard it from somebody and said that if you got if you were sitting in your house and somebody came and told you that uh, your child was in the vicinity when there was a big lorry accident this would not amount to the same level of shock and therefore damages may not be recovered in that case but when you yourself are the witness it is like likely that you would go through an amount of shock which could uh, endanger your life and therefore uh, your uh, estate or your husband could recover damages now goodhart while looking at this case and the facts as it lay asked whether the fact that the deceased or the woman was the child's mother was an important or a material fact considered by the court as against a mere bystander See, it was not the mother of the child, but her nanny. Would a death of the nanny by shock to see her owner's or her uh, um, boss's child being in an unsafe place caused her husband to get the same amount of damages? And Goodhart suggested that if it was considered a material fact, then it is only the mother or the father or a person in that closer relationship who could claim for damages in subsequent cases. But if this was not considered a material fact, then any other person who was a bystander who may not be related to the child or who may be very distantly related could also recover damages in certain uh, similar circumstances.
And the answer to that is uh, this was Lord Atkins who had decided Hambrook versus Stokes. And he had mentioned that I am not so sure that the same principle would not apply to a bystander, thereby opening gates, thereby saying that this is not a material fact, that it was the mother of the child who had seen uh, her son in an unsafe place and therefore uh, died of shock. So this is, these are the three uh, basic tests that can be applied to identify the ratio. And if we can rightly identify the ratio, it can help us in relying on certain judgments or breaking the opposition's case when they rely on a judgment by saying that this is not the ratio and what you're quoting is only the obiter, the ratio is something else. Now we move to the second part of the talk, which is the rules of interpretation. Now the basic rule, as all of you would already be aware, is the literal rule, that whatever the statute says, that is the law and that is how it will be interpreted. You will not add anything, you will not try to change anything, you will take it as it is. And this is naturally uh, the real or uh, the better way to interpret laws. However, uh, if the words are clear and unambiguous, then the courts are not allowed to move beyond the literal rule. Now, what was the problem with literal rule? In certain cases, uh, the parliament made the law envisioning what all could happen in the future. A law is never to govern what happened in the past. It is always to govern what could happen in the future. And when the parliament or any legislature makes laws, there could always be certain gaps which could be misused by miscreants unless the courts are applying the law with a sense of understanding that such absurd results could not have been envisioned by the parliament. So to quote a few examples which led, for, uh, which led the um, courts to shift from the literal rule to the golden rule. The first case was where uh, Restriction of Offenses Weapons Act in 1959, which made it an offense to sell a particular kind of knife, uh, was not able to be invoked because the judge said that uh, the knife was only displayed in the window of a shop, which is only an invitation to offer and it is not really a sale. And because of this, the shopkeeper could go scot-free. So they would not come within the clutches of this act, though this act was made specifically for such situations. The second case was um, when uh, a section in a particular statute made it an offense to impersonate any person entitled to vote, but a person took a plea that who I have impersonated is not a person entitled to vote, but it is a dead person. And therefore, I will not be governed by this statute. And he was let scot-free again because the court said our hands are bound and we have to literally interpret the law. The third case was an Indian case where the limitation period prescribed to come out with um, a grievance was of 60 days. Um, I'm sorry, it was of 60 days and the impugned declaration was never made public. Then the question was whether the 60 day period would commence from the knowledge of the person having the order or would it commence from the date of actual issuance of the order. And I'll just now show which these cases were. The first case where we discussed about the knife being an offer, uh, invitation to offer was Fisher versus Bell in 1960. And here the courts went by the literal interpretation and they said we could not uh, penalize this person under the statute. Similarly, in Whitley versus Chapel, uh, the question about impersonating a dead person uh, came into play. And here again, the court held that uh, Mr. D was not guilty since a dead person is not literally entitled to vote. All of these led to very wrong conclusions or consequences, but the court was only literally interpreting the statutes. Now, this is an Indian uh, Supreme Court judgment wherein they said that um, under the Motor Vehicles Act 1939, if uh, the bus stand location was changed by the Regional Transport Authority, then uh, the person aggrieved would have a period of 30 days to approach uh, the court with its uh, grievance uh, or the authority with its grievance. Uh, 
and this person could not go within 30 days because uh, the location though changed on paper was not actually changed in practice and the order issued was never publicized anywhere so he went with a plea saying that i did not have knowledge and this 30 day period should only begin from knowledge and should not literally begin from the day it was issued the supreme court held that we are bound by the literal interpretation and therefore we cannot give you a day beyond the 30 day period as prescribed under the statute now all of these cases caused harsh consequences and that was an issue which came up in tata consultancy wherein the court said that a literal construction would not be denied only because the consequences to comply with the same lead to a penalty. The court should not be overzealous in searching for ambiguities or obscurities when the words are plain. Now, what was the need for better interpretation than uh, the literal rule of interpretation? Some other uh, cases happened which led to the golden rule and the two forms of golden rule being a narrow way of interpreting it and a wider way of interpreting it. One of the cases was uh, where offences against Person Act 1861 was in question where it said that it is an offence to marry while your original spouse who you have not yet divorced is still alive. A person came to the court and said, look here, I have not divorced my wife. And therefore, I cannot literally, in the true sense of law, get married to another person. Whatever I have with the other person is not marriage because my first marriage is not dissolved in the true sense. And therefore, I do not commit any offense under Section 57 of the Offenses Against Person Act 1861. Here, the court was now forced and pushed against the wall to say enough of literal interpretation. We need to do what is right. We need to look at what the parliament would have meant while uh, coming out with this legislation. And then they came up with what was called the golden rule, which said that literal interpretation would allow for courts to intervene and have a different interpretation if the literal rule would lead to an absurd result. Now, the scope of golden rule was again in question. Should the language be ambiguous for the golden rule to apply? Now, literal rule itself said, if it was ambiguous, you can interpret in your own manner. Golden rule came because even if language is not ambiguous, still we could use other rules of interpretation. Now, this is another case where a son had murdered his mother and the mother had not made a will. And the interstate laws would suggest that her next of kin would inherit because there was no will. There was no ambiguity in the statute. It was very clear. Now, the question before the courts was, can this son be permitted to inherit the estate of the dead mother who is dead because he killed the mother? And the court said that though there is no ambiguity, we will have to apply our good sense and discretion and say that a murderer cannot be awarded uh, for uh, the crime. And they moved beyond the literal rule to the golden rule, even in case of ambiguity. Hence came the two versions of the golden rule. One is the narrow application in uh, the case of R versus Allen, which is uh, the case of uh, uh, marriage, because the word marry could have two interpretations. It could either mean literally the marry uh, by going through a ceremony of marriage, or it could mean the legal uh, understanding of marriage, which is to have divorced the earlier wife and then enter into the institution of marriage. Because there are two possible interpretations, the court would say, we will use that interpretation which does not lead to absurdity. And this is the narrow application of the golden rule. There is, however, a wider application, uh, which is R versus Sigworth, uh, which is the case, the facts of which we just discussed where uh, the son who had murdered the mother was not uh, granted uh, any inheritance rights in her property because despite the unambiguity of the provision, the courts refused to let a murderer benefit from his crime and invoke the principle of public policy. Now, this wider application of golden rule is nothing but what we in India call the purposive construction of statutes. The purposive approach is 
that the judges try and decide what they believe the parliament meant to achieve when it legislated a certain statute and lord denning was the greatest advocate of the purposive approach in mega versus st melens versus newport construction uh, corporation in 1950 lord denning has said the following words we do not sit here to pull the language of the parliament to pieces and make nonsense of it we sit here to find out the intention of the parliament and carry it out and we do this better by filling in the gaps and making sense of the enactment than by opening it up to destructive analysis now what lord denning has attempted to say here is rather brave no judge would ever admit that they fill in the gaps in the statutes but lord denning being his nature has always gone against um, the flow now some cases regarding purposive uh, construction are as follows first is r versus registrar general and this is uh, a more recent case as compared to the earlier judgments uh, in the 1990s and here the facts were whether uh, the adoption act where section 18 said that any person uh, at the age of 18 could ask for his birth certificate and could find out who his mother was even if he has been given an adoption or he has been given uh, to an orphanage and here mr smith wanted a certificate in order to find his uh, real birth mother the problem was that he was suffering from a serious mental instability and psychosis and he was convicted for consequent murders of women that he believed to be his adoptive mothers so a uh, natural understanding was if he found his birth mother he would be likely to cause her some amount of danger and though the literal rule said that uh, as per the statute he could have the certificate the purposive approach was applied by the courts and they said that the parliament could never have intended to promote such a serious crime or even under engenderment of a person to such a crime this leads to um, the mischief rule which was um, brought up in the uk in the case of hayden whereas it was brought in india in the case of bengal immunity versus state of bihar but in both these judgments similar rules are derived and at the crux of mischief rule is to understand what is the mischief that the parliament tried to correct when it was legislating the statute and what was the remedy that was given to correct this mischief once you understand these two main roadblocks then you can interpret any statute to see beyond its literal words and see what is the mischief it is trying to create uh, trying to prevent and by what remedy would that be prevented uh, these are the four questions that are uh, asked by judges to themselves before uh, they can interpret using uh, the mischief rule first is what was the common law before the statute was enacted second is what was the mischief and the precise defect that the common law did not provide and the statute aimed to uh, prevent third what is the remedy that the parliament has resolved and fourth what is the true reason for the remedy and in the mischief rule what we uh, usually look at is the um, objects and reasons of any statute now smith versus hughes is a celebrated case from the uk wherein uh, the mischief rule was applied and here uh, the question was of the street offences act which said that soliciting by prostitutes was an offence now uh, the facts of this case were that a defence was made by these women that they were not standing on the streets and they were not soliciting on the streets per se but they were inside the building and tapping on a window to uh, solicit customers despite such being the facts and literally not coming within the offence of the street offences act the court applied the mischief rule and found them guilty because they said that the act was designed to prevent the mischief of prostitution on public places like the streets uh the royal college of nursing versus dhss here uh, the question was of the abortion act 1967 and the issue involved was what is the scope and interpretation that can be given to registered medical practitioner 
would it mean only doctors or would it mean would it also cover nurses now the court of appeal said that the word is very clear it says registered medical practitioner so it would obviously only include doctors and not include the nurses but the house of lords looked at the object of the abortion act and they said the act intends to stop not only legalized abortions but also back street abortions which are conducted by nurses without the supervision or with very slight supervision by doctors so they said that as long as any abortion was supervised by doctor even remotely it would come within the uh, four corners of the abortion act and it would be an offense under this act and this case emphasized the danger that judges may be tempted to allow if their moral convictions were to interfere because when the judges are allowed to interpret the law they have a huge responsibility and a lot of autonomy to decide whether the gray facts fall more in the scope of black or they fall more in the scope of white so it's very important that neither we as lawyers and officers of the court nor the judges uh, let our morals or personal beliefs and biases interfere in our judgment when dealing with the law Uh, another rule of construction is the beneficial uh, rule vis-a-vis -vis the strict rule of construction now whenever there are statutes like welfare statutes uh, say for instance the labor laws or the land acquisition act these are all meant to provide certain benefits to a class of people and all these statutes the courts have uh, interpreted over many years that all these statutes must be interpreted in the widest possible manner where the maximum amount of benefits can be given uh, to the persons on other end of this case because these are meant for the benefit of those person and the very object of the statute is beneficial at its core vis-a-vis -vis the other uh, canon of construction which is the strict strict rule of construction which is used in either the penal statutes or the tax legislations which says that because um the penal statutes are at some level going to take away your liberty or the taxing statutes are going to affect you monetarily uh, both these statutes have to be interpreted rather narrowly and very very strictly it has to mean exactly what it says or you could not add any words to give it any wider interpretation because the accused or the assessee has to be protected and he would only be charged by what the legislature says and not by that what the courts or uh, the judges would believe it has said so these are very distinct rules literally opposite to each other but they play in very different areas uh, an example of the beneficial rule is uh, shah versus the presiding officer 1978 supreme court judgment and here the question was whether the maternity benefits act when it says that you can take 12 weeks of maternity leave on full salary did it mean the week to have 6 days or did it mean the week to have 7 days because sunday is a holiday so would this lady be entitled to 6 days a week of 12 weeks full salary or 7 days a week of uh, 12 weeks of full salary and the supreme court relying on the beneficial rule of uh, construction said that because this is a beneficial legislation we must interpret it to involve as many days as possible which is 84 days considering it's a 7 day week there are some other rules which are sometimes brought uh, into play one is that of trade parlance this is majorly used in uh, customs excise or any other tax matters where the court has said that any word must be understood as it is generally used in that trade circle so when we say the word wax paper or bituminized paper it may mean something else scientifically but what it means in that trade circle for all the people who um, indulge in buying and selling of this kind of material for them whatever it means that is the interpretation that the court must derive the second rule is of exceptional construction whenever the word or and may shall is used these words can be interpreted interchangeably or can sometimes mean and 
and can sometimes mean or may could mean shall shall could mean may depending on the context of the case but this is not the ordinary construction this is exceptionally used if the entire context of the statute or that particular provision uh, is inclining towards and but the word used is or then or can be given the meaning of and uh, the third rule to cover is reading down what this means is that a statute can be read down suppose a statute says that um, if a is not done consequence of b will follow but in one out of a thousand cases a does not really fulfill the object that the statute wishes to fulfill then the courts can say that in all cases if a does not happen then consequence shall follow except for this particular case though that exception is not provided in the statute the court can read it down and say certain other things because if it does not say that it would lead to absurdity uh, i understand this is slightly complicated so we'll just do an example uh, after i'm done with this slide there are few other phrases which uh, tend some amount of uh, importance in interpretation like the word including whenever there is a list of things and it begins with the word including say for instance um, all these activities are prohibited including cycling swimming and walking then the list is not limited to these three activities but it would be a non exhaustive list which could include many other things like these three things or any other activity which falls in the general category or class of these three activities which are mentioned um just opposite to including if the word used is means that a particular thing means x y z then it would mean an exhaustive list but the word including means a non exhaustive list uh, then there is the contemporaneous exposition which means that a contemporaneous exposition is the best form of exposition and it is considered the strongest in law anything that is um contemporary that it is based on current factual and social scenario that exposition has greater value than something which is an antique of the past this is an example for the reading down which we would also come back to later in the question of casus omnis um this is a real case that we were arguing in the high court which is now uh, concluded but the facts were this that there was a general instruction by the maharashtra public service commission which said in one of its clauses that the non criminal certificate should be submitted at the time of the interview it further said that the non criminal certificate which is required to be submitted should be of the financial year preceding the year in which the advertisement is issued and any non criminal certificate of earlier years will not be considered valid now what was the object of asking for the non criminal certificate of only the year preceding the year of the advertisement the object was this sometimes people will get a non criminal for one of the years and then their position economic position could change and 10 years later when you are much richer when you do not in any way fit into the non criminal category you cannot use that certificate to secure a certain appointment or a post or even admissions to certain places for that matter and keeping that in mind that a more recent certificate will show your economic status more accurately it was said in the uh, instructions that the ncl certificate should be of the year preceding the year in which the advertisement is issued and not of earlier years now in our case when we represented mr raudhut puri he had an ncl certificate of the very year of the advertisement of course prior to the date of the advertisement but not in the last financial year in the same financial year as that of the advertisement and the mpsc refused to uh, allow him to appear for the interview saying that he had not submitted the ncl certificate of the earlier years now our uh, case before the high court was that it would lead to absurdity if the literal rule is applied 
and though the words of the general instructions are unambiguous and very clear the court must read it down and must add that unless you have the ncl certificate of the, the year in which the advertisement was issued that will be considered valid so this was uh, the example now moving on to the last section of this talk which is the legal maxims in interpretation of statutes one of the most used and most useful maxim is that of nociterae sources not many people know uh, the bigger genre of nociterae sources but most of us are accustomed to ejusdem generis which is a subset or a species of the bigger genre of nociterae sources so what does nociterae sources mean it really means that anything is known from its associates again a latin phrase which literally translates into anything is known from its associates how it is understood uh the courts have understood nociterae sources doctrine to mean that if there is one word that can be easily uh, identified and limited by its understanding but the other word is confusing or ambiguous or void then this other word will take the color of the first word and will have the same limitations as the first word has ejusdem generis is a subset of nociterae sources and it says that if there is a list of words and which ends with a general word like etc or like any other like these then this general word would be limited and interpreted in the context of the list let me give you an example for this so powell versus kempton race course 1899 there was a list of places which was a list of things which was mentioned like uh, a house an office a room and the last word was any other place so the court was uh, posed with a question what would any other place amount to could it mean the uh, hallway could it mean um, the staircase could it mean the lawns could it mean the wedding hall and the court said that look at the common factor in all these places that are mentioned earlier house office and room these are all places which are indoors so a public place in the outside will not be considered as any other place and any other place will have to be limited by understanding that is given to the earlier three words now a case in the citerae sources even when there is no list one word can derive meaning from the other word here the question was um about what kind of explosives can be taken to a mine and if they are taken to a mine whether they would be uh, covered by the statute or not and here the they said that the explosives taken to a mine must be in a case or a canister but in this particular case uh, the explosives that were carried were carried in linen bags the question before the court was would this uh, be within the four corners of the statute which use the word case or canister the court using the rule of nociterae sources said that both these words case and canister imply that it is something strong that is being used to carry the gunpowder or the explosives and only in these strong cases made from wood or metal or any other solid substances uh, which can be covered over so as to prevent ignition from a spark these will be covered under the statute and not a case where gunpowder was carried in linen bag Uh, this was also used the adjustment general principle in many indian cases one of the more famous cases is sideshwari cotton mills versus union of india in which um, the supreme court had said that uh, uh, the words any other process which appear after the words bleaching mercerizing dyeing printing waterproofing rubberizing shrink proofing organic processing Uh, in section 2f of the central excise and salt act 1944 the court said that these words any other process would have to be seen in the light of the earlier 78 processes that are mentioned and what is the common thread in all these 78 processes is that all of them lead to a lasting change and it changes the entire nature of the uh, material after bleaching and before bleaching the material is entirely different 
after dying and before dying the material is entirely different so any other process must be such a process which completely changes uh, the nature of uh, the product and it is of a lasting the process is of lasting nature we had used the principle of ejusdem generis in a recent case where a public interest litigation was filed in 2016 um asking the court to reconstitute or quash the notification constituting uh, the trust of shirdi sansthan by the state government because we said that all these people had many offenses against them and they were not having a good moral character and the court said that uh, whether they would be disqualified under the statute you must prove to us that they would be disqualified and then we interpreted section 91f of the uh, shri sai baba sansthan act 2004 um, and what f said was that a person if he is guilty of misconduct or he has been charged cheated for an offence involving moral turpitude or is otherwise found to be unfit so these last four words otherwise found to be unfit were interpreted in the light of ejusdem generis and we told the court that uh, guilty of misconduct is one end of the spectrum an offence for which he is charged cheated in moral turpitude is another end of the spectrum and everything in between could amount to something otherwise found to be unfit and the court has beautifully expounded on this and said even if we see that somebody is involved in a business of tobacco or does not have a good moral standing all of these things can be considered in whether he is found to be unfit or not mm, another uh, doctrine that can be used sometimes is expressio unius s exclusion alteris which means what is expressed by the statute puts an end to what is implied so if something is expressly mentioned what it means that everything that is not expressly mentioned is to be denied or is not to be included in the meaning of the statute this was again used in one of our cases where we said that the food safety and standards act 2006 more specifically section 2j uh, which defines food did not include drinking water which was not packaged it only include the packaged drinking water so we said all the water that is sold without a packaging and which is sold in big barrels without even a um, uh, rubber without uh, a topping which is open from the uh, top this would not come within the definition of food under section 2j now we come to an area which is extremely interesting and uh, equally confounding it is called casus omissus and it literally translates from latin into case that is omitted the the original maxim uh, was understood to mean that if there is a gap in the legislation the court shall never venture to fill in the same now, we must recall what lord denning said uh, in the saint melix case he said that we will not sit here and technically see the courts uh, shred away legislations but we will fill in the gaps whenever we, we see the gaps and the original doctrine of casus omissus says that even if there is a gap the courts will not fill in but there is like we see and we have seen in the earlier judgments which move from literal interpretation to golden to purposive and mischief rule that there is an oscillation between uh, the narrow interpretation of the maxim which says that you should not fill in the gaps to the wider interpretation which says that you can fill in the gaps if there is an absurdity now the uk position uh, has shifted many times um meger versus uh, melins uh, where lord denning said what he said that i read out earlier uh, went on to the um, house of lords where lord simons had really criticized lord denning's approach and said the judiciary cannot nakedly usurp the legislative function and then disguise it under the name of interpretation however we see a comeback of this doctrine where uh, gaps can be filled by lord diplock's exposition in wentworth securities versus jones but he puts three conditions he says that you must be able to precisely determine the mischief there must be apparent and inadvertent omission by the draftsman and the ability to state with certainty the language the draftsman would have otherwise employed which you would then employ 
and this was more recently in 2000 also upheld uh, in inco europe by the house of lords indian position uh, is also confusing because in bangalore water supply we very readily agree to uh, the stand taken by lord denning and we give a very wide interpretation uh, when we are defining the scope of industry under the statute um similarly in the dissenting opinion of honorable justice subarao in state of up versus deoman section 27 of the evidence act was in question uh, which talks about whether the um, statement of an accused which is given when in police custody and it leads to a discovery of a fact and a statement which is not given uh, in police custody but is given rather when the person is uh, at uh, is at liberty and not in uh, under arrest would these be two different classes in the first class it would be an admissible evidence under section 27 when somebody is in the police custody and in the other class if you are not in the police custody it would not be uh, admissible evidence under section 27 so the majority judgment in deoman upadhyay's case said that uh, we will have to literally interpret section 27 and uh, this class of people who are not in custody and yet their statement of admission leads to a discovery of fact is a very narrow uh, group of people and therefore uh, section 27 does not apply to it but honorable justice subarao very rightly has pointed out that this is an absurdity and it is um, only something that was overlooked by the parliament because till the um, evidence act came in in um, 72 earlier to that always both classes of uh, accused within the custody of the police or outside were given equal treatment so far as admissions of their statement are concerned and this cannot change merely because the word or is missed out by the draftsman now uh, the case as it stands today still uses the literal interpretation only time will tell whether uh, honorable justice subarao's dissenting opinion becomes the law of the land um some other uh, examples of uh, oscillation between the wide and the narrow interpretation are the os singh judgment in 1996 and then the more recent dharmendra textile judgment uh, an interesting take which comes from an indian perspective is of mimamsa interpretation where honorable justice katju who was a sanskrit scholar um, and also held uh, uh, the bench at supreme court for a very long time he says that uh, in sanskrit uh, doctrine of mimamsa there is a whole school of interpretation which is a lot more detailed than um, the western system of interpretation and here they give many categories of cases omissus when it can be permissible and when it cannot be permissible and justice kaju advocates that it is the mimamsa style of interpretation which can help us to find the solution uh, in the cases omissus problem Uh, we use this like we mentioned in the earlier set of facts for uh, audhut puri's case where we told the court that yes there is a gap in the guidelines but unless the court can fill it it would lead to absurdity and therefore this cases omissus ought to be filled uh one of the last tools of construction is that of harmonious construction here the court says that if there is a contradiction between uh, two provisions of the same statutes or two provisions of two different statutes then the first attempt and this is always the first rule of construction if there is a contradiction between uh, two provisions of statutes that uh, the court will try to harmoniously construct both uh, the provisions and court will try to find a golden mean between these two provisions and say how both of them can coexist without there being a conflict uh, the 1954 judgment in raj krishna versus binod dealt with the representation of people's act 1951 and here there were two sections which were slightly contradictory one section being section 33 sub clause 2 said that the government servant can nominate or second a person in election now section 1238 said that a government servant cannot assist any candidate in election except by casting his vote 
Now, these two sections seemingly looked like contradictory to each other because at one place they say that government uh, servant can nominate uh, a person in election. But 123.8 says he can do nothing else in assisting but to cast his vote. So the Supreme Court said the way we will have to interpret section 123.8 in light of harmonious construction is that we say in no other condition except for nominating a person in election can a government servant assist a candidate except by casting his vote. So both these were allowed to coexist. Now that's the end of this presentation, but uh, it surely should not be the end of how we use these tools for interpretation. Let's discuss uh, if there are any questions that we can take. I'll just stop the sharing mode. Okay, there are lots of questions which have come in the chat. Um, let me just look at some of the questions. Um, okay, somebody's asked an off topic issue which we'll take in the end. Mm. Okay, all the questions are with regards to LLM from a foreign university. Mm, okay, I'll take this uh, question till there are any other questions on uh, interpretation and tools of interpretation. So, uh, what I feel, and this is a personal perspective, that uh, LLM always helps people to ground your knowledge. And the way uh, law or any other subject is taught in our country, um, it's great, it's not bad but there is very little uh, importance or emphasis laid on self-studying. Most of it is still very traditional where teachers will take some lectures, you will go back to class, you will do some evaluation and that will be the end of life. Nowadays, we see the national law schools are breaking this tradition and there are a lot of activities and I'm, I'm sure many other colleges like ILS, GLC are also in the same uh, group where students are encouraged to self-learn and are promoted to take up activities which help them to apply and question and hypothesize, play with the law, play with the facts. This is done much more uh, in foreign universities where we, and I, I do not say it as a general thing. You will have to see which university you're comparing in uh, other countries like the UK or the US and you will see which uh, are you comparing in India. But generally, for me, in my perspective, if you go to a very good university for your LLM, it will help you uh, be more humble because you see so many great people, people that in India, we only quote. When I was at Oxford, we had quoted so many people in our moot courts and projects. And now in Oxford, I was sitting with those people across the table and they were so humble. They would listen, they would be 80, 90 year old people who would very keenly listen to some new ideas that we would come up with and say, oh, I never thought about it. And for a 21 year old to be told by an 80 year old person who has spent his entire life researching on this area that I never thought about the perspective that you are giving me is indefinitely uh, encouraging. And that helps you see the perspective that, you know, who I am and how much I know doesn't matter. It's important to be humble. So that's one thing that you learn. The other more relevant thing for law is that you learn how to break down and analyze the law. You start learning how to uh, decode the bigger issue into smaller subsets. And though the laws will be different in every country, but once you learn the modes of analysis, interpretation, application, they're going to be the same universally. So if anybody is considering applying uh, to a very good university, and I stress the operative part is a good university, for LLM or a PhD, I would definitely say uh, it is something that should be done. Is there any other question, sir, from anybody? Yeah. Question of Evidence Act. Um, so is asked on Evidence Act, Section 3. On facts that need to be proved, disproved, and not proved. That's so that, that can, that's really a very, very wide arena, and it would take another hour or so to uh, delve into detail. But I feel that not only Section 3 and not only these particular words, but any words in any statute can now be interpreted using the tools that we just discussed.
um, also share the difference between may presume and shall presume. Okay. So this is uh, again, this goes back to the general rule, which says that sometimes shall can be substituted by may, but not in cases like the Evidence Act, where they have given different rules for shall presume and may presume. So whenever an Evidence Act is uh, one of the few statutes which gives you illustrations, they will first lay down a principle and then they will give you an illustration. And while illustration is never binding or limiting in the scope of the provision, the original provision is never bound by a, so I've left out many issues in interpretation. Uh, one of them is how a provision is interpreted. If there are provisos, if there are caveats in the provision, the main provision can say X is the principle and then exceptions can be carved out in the provisos or there can be illustrations which are limiting in some fashion. So the courts have interpreted and said that these illustrations will only be exhaustive to understand that particular factual scenario. But it would never limit the operation of the provision in other situations which are not covered by the illustration. So similarly, when we are saying shall presume and may presume, we will have to look at the differences in the two categories and the illustrations in both the categories and then apply the rules of interpretation to it. Suggest the university from UK and USA. One more question from our uh, Sudhir so, Goswal. Uh, before I suggest the universities, because it's a long list, what I'll suggest is there's a difference between when you do LLM from the UK and the US. Uh, and the basic difference is if you want to practice in the US, uh, doing an LLM from the US is better because US uh, universities make you compulsorily cover some uh, procedural laws which are required in the US, which are US federal laws, which may be of not much relevance to Indian context. That is one. Second is US is more um, flexible in its evaluation system. It is more modern in its evaluation system. So you can have about 10 or 20 or even five courses, depending on how many credits each of the course. So they call it electives. There are few compulsory courses like a parallel of the civil procedure code, a parallel of the criminal uh, procedure code, the American constitution, etc. And other than these four compulsory courses, all the courses can be chosen. So they are called the electives. And you can take electives ranging from music to dance, to psychology, to some law, so it's it basically you can club everything into your LLM and credits can be one credit course, which is very small, which will be only a week long course to a larger credit, which can go on to two, three months. But UK LLMs on the other hand are more traditional. They go on for the whole year. So you take only about four subjects and all those four subjects uh, you study for the entire year. And in the end, you are given traditional exams. Very few courses will have a thesis submission instead of or a dissertation instead of an examination. But most courses will have an examination with about a list of seven to eight questions. So depending on what you're looking for in the future, you should opt between uh, UK and the US. And uh, top universities are the Ivy Leagues in the US, Harvard, Stanford, um, Berkeley, etc. And in the UK, it's Cambridge, Oxford. How long was your course in the UK? It was a year long. Uh, how long is the course generally in UK? It's always in UK as well as the US, it is one year long course. You can certainly return to India for practice after doing an LLM. In fact, even after doing an LLB abroad, you can return. There are a list of about 25 universities which the BCI recognizes that even if you do your undergraduate degree from abroad, you can come back and um, practice law here. And it's very interesting because the UK lets you um, take admission to law course directly after class 12. And it's a three year law course. No other country, you can be a lawyer at the age of 21. In India, it's a five year law course after class 12. In UK, they call it BA in jurisprudence. They don't call it uh, LLB. It's BA in jurisprudence and you do it directly after class 12th. So you can save on a lot of years if you decide to do your undergraduate from uh, the UK. They're asking for next lecture on Indian Evidence Act and interpretation. Next I'll session. Be, I'll be most uh, glad to do it. Thank I'm you. so happy, but uh, and I hope that uh, this was uh, useful for uh, yes. everybody. 
So unless there are any other questions, should we stop here? Uh, I think there is no question, no more questions. Okay. Thank you so much. If anybody is interested, I could share the PPT if people want to kind of use these judgments ahead. So if you do get any requests, let me know and I will send it across. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. The pleasure is mine. Ladies and gentlemen, a very good evening to all. It gives me an immense pleasure to deliver a word of thanks for this webinar to all the senior and junior advocates and dignitaries who have participated in this webinar, listening very cautiously and patiently. I would like to thank our today's chief guest, Advocate Pradhna Talekar, who honored this virtual platform with her informative and educative thoughts and examples. Once again, I thank you all for listening to our today's guest lecture, Badna Talekar, ma'am, very patiently, and thank you for sharing your opinion and platform, which will be very helpful for everyone. I also thank who have been watching on YouTube channel, Nasik Bar Association, and patiently wait for the next video to be uploaded. Uh, I appeal to all, please do like, share, and subscribe to our channel, where you will get our all videos from beginning. Thank you. Thanks all once again. Thank you very much.